The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing us under of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 1 Peter 1, 13-14 Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. Isaiah 1, 19 to 20. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. 1 Peter 2, 13 to 15. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Following our customary procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer in order that uh, we might be properly and uh, academically prepared to concentrate on the teaching of the Word of God. But for us believers in Christ, we are to utilize the principle of 1 John 1, 9 called the rebound technique before we can start our Bible study. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, when we use the rebound technique, which is otherwise called confession of sins or divine eraser, by the way, there are steps to follow in the rebound technique. Well, this is a review, but uh, just to remind ourselves, first step is when we rebound or confess our sins, we have to name your, our sins. Admit, accept, acknowledge that uh, we have committed those sins. And then we should isolate our sins. We should disengage ourselves from forgiven sins. Forgiven sins no longer belong to us. And number three, forget your sins. Press on to the ground of spiritual maturity. Strengthen more your edification complex of the soul. And then number four, keep moving. Get back to the operational divine atmosphere or protocol plan of God and produce again divine good and divine viewpoint. Avoid being influenced by the old sin nature. Keep away from sinning again. Go through with the other nine problem-solving devices and be strong and invincible. 
So we have to obey God and His Word. We have to put on the whole armor of God. So that is the procedure we have to follow before we study God's Word. Therefore, mentally let us pray to prepare ourselves in the study of God's Word. Let us pray. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that uh, we can gather ourselves again together today to worship you, to study your word, and to focus our attention on your word that uh, teaches us as to who and what you are. That the only thing that matters in our life is to be oriented to grace, to be oriented to your plan for our life, because apart from it, there is no stability, there is no happiness, there is no meaning in life. It is only when we are oriented to your plan, beginning at the cross, that uh, we can have an understanding, our reality and our purpose in our destiny in life and what you are doing in our life. So, Father, as we worship you, we pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will enlighten us, challenge us, motivate us, and make these things a blessing to us. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, welcome once again all of our uh, listeners, followers, our subscribers, and our um, fellow believers, welcome each and every one of you. So we continue our discussion on our topic, the unique spiritual life of the believer in Jesus Christ. Now these things we are discussing, it's on uh, the uh, doctrine of soteriology, which is part of our discussion. Okay, so we have said that Anybody who himself is a sinner cannot be the savior of others because he himself is condemned. Therefore, Christ is the only possible savior. Okay? Now, we mentioned about unlimited redemption. In Hebrews 2.9, the word of God says he tasted death on behalf of every member of the human race. 1 Timothy 2.6 He gave himself a ransom on behalf of all to be testified in due time. Now, the word all there means all members of the human race. Now, not all of the elect. Yes, Christ died for the elect, but he also died for the non-elect. He died for those who are going to receive Him as Savior. He also died for all those who are going to reject Him as Savior. So salvation is provided for all. 1 John 2.2 2, He is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only but also for the sins of the whole world. And that's not the whole world of the elect, but it means the entire human race. Because our sins there refers to the sins of believers. But the whole world means it includes both believers as well as unbelievers. So, unlimited redemption. Then, we have the penalty of sin. And the penalty of sin is spiritual death. That is, total separation of man from God. That is removed by the doctrine of expiation. He took the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which is contrary to us, nailing it to his cross in Colossians 2.14. Whenever the Romans crucified anybody, and they had crucifixions for different reasons. Revolt against the state, 
slave revolt, murder, military problems that developed where we had traitors to the state. They were executed by crucifixion and they always nailed a sign to the cross of the individual being crucified. Traitor, murderer, whatever it might be, kidnapper. They always nailed the sign. Well, Pontius Pilate made sure to throw on the Jews' face whom the religious leadership of Israel had railroaded Christ to crucifixion. Pontius Pilate knew that Christ was innocent, but he didn't have the backbone to stand up against the religious leadership of Israel. He had the military power, but he didn't have the backbone to do it. He was afraid for his own political career. Always a grandiose mistake. And so, he had nailed to the cross of Christ, King of the Jews. And he had written in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin, expiation, penalty of sin, removed. Then, we have the character of God, specifically His righteousness and His justice. Now, the standards of God are not compromised. You see, the big issue in salvation is, how could God provide salvation for the human race without compromising the nature or the integrity of His character? And there is only one way to do it, and that is to satisfy the demands of the character of God without compromising the nature or the integrity of His character. And here is the way it provided. Christ is born or virgin born. Therefore, He becomes a member of the human race without the imputation of Adam's sin and without an old sin nature. And from his perfect positive response, his perfect positive volition, he never committed an act of personal sin. Never. And therefore, this adds up to the fact that in his humanity, he is perfect righteousness. The righteous humanity of Christ satisfies the righteousness of the Godhead that demands that the one who paid a penalty for man's sin has to be perfect. That is why Christ is the only qualified member of the human race to be the Savior. Nobody else can be. But that's only part of the problem. The other part of the problem is the justice of God. And that's where spiritual death comes in. Now, there are seven different deaths in scriptures. One is spiritual death. Two, physical death. Three, second death. Four, reproductive death or sexual death. Five, positional death. Six, carnal death. And seven, productional death or operational death. Christ died twice on the cross. Bear that in mind. The first time He died, He was in three hours of spiritual death. He was placed on the cross at nine o'clock in the morning, called the third hour of the day. And at the sixth hour of the day, at twelve noon, God the Father started pouring out the sins of the human race to Christ on the cross. And he was in spiritual death for three hours. And it was dark over Palestine. And after three hours of spiritual death, he declared in John 19.30 in the Greek, Tetelestai. It has been completed in the past, where the result remains completed in the present and extends into the future permanently 
and forever. Salvation has been provided for all members of the human race. In the past, perfect tense, he is still physically alive on the cross. Now, one of the greatest misnomers in Christianity is that Christ shed his blood on the cross for the sins of mankind. He didn't shed his blood on the cross. In the first place, he didn't bleed to death. He bled, yes. He bled prior to the cross. He bled on the cross. From the nails that pierced his hands and his feet. But he was still bleeding from the scalp. A little bit from the scalp. From the thorn that had been shoved into his scalp. From the crown that was made out of thorn. He bled from his back from the horrendous beating he had taken in the courtyard of the Roman Praetorium. But he didn't bleed to death on the cross. And he never lapsed into unconsciousness. He voluntarily dismissed his soul and his spirit. From his body on the tree, as Luke 23, 43 to 46 describes so poignantly, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He voluntarily dismissed his soul and his spirit, but he didn't bleed to death. And the bleeding that Christ did on the cross has nothing, nothing per se, to do with the provision of our great, so great salvation. The shedding of the animal's blood in the Old Testament, when the animal was taken on the brazen altar and tied down, and his throat was slit, and the offerer placed one hand upon the head of the animal, and with the other hand he took the sacrificial knife, and he slit the animal's throat, the animal or animal would kick and try to get away, but it couldn't because it was tied down and eventually it would be exhausted and eventually lapses into unconsciousness because of the deprivation of oxygen to the brain and from there into a coma and finally in a few minutes would die. It was the loss of the animal's blood that caused the physical death of the animal. Well. Christ lost blood on the cross, but he didn't bleed to death. And his physical death, therefore, was not caused by bleeding to death, but rather by the voluntary dismissal of his soul and his spirit. Furthermore, the shedding of the animal's blood in the Old Testament is used as a frame of reference for the spiritual death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Because while the people could see the animal finally expire at the brazen altar, they couldn't see Christ in spiritual death. What the gospel accounts, as a matter of fact, record for us are the historical events, but they don't explain doctrinally what's going on. It takes the epistles to do that. It was the spiritual death of Christ for three hours on the cross, from noon until three in the afternoon. That was the mechanism of the provision of our so great salvation. And that spiritual death on the cross is what satisfied the justice of the Godhead. So the righteousness and justice of the Godhead are satisfied or the biblical term as propitiation. So now the love of God flows to man by way of the cross, and that is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that everyone believing in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. When Christ died on the cross for the sins of the human race, in and of itself, while he died for all, 
Nobody was actually saved by his death on the cross. Man, listen, man still must appropriate what God has provided. And this is what the hyper-Calvinists do not want to face. The free will of man. The freedom of man. The unbeliever has been given freedom as a part of being created by God where man is created with self-consciousness in his soul, with mentality in his soul, volition in his soul, conscience in his soul, and emotion in his soul. Man has freedom. Unbelievers make choices every day. Believers make choices every day. People make choices. Life is built around the volition of man. The entire plan of God is built upon the volition of man. The prohibition given to Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis 2, 16 and 17 is nonsense if man does not have freedom. But man does have freedom. And God jealously guards the freedom of all members of the human race. God guards the freedom of the unbeliever to the point that God will allow the unbeliever he has empowered the unbeliever to exercise his freedom with negative volition to reject Christ as Savior and spend eternity in the lake of fire, distinctly contrary to the declared will of God in 1 Timothy 2.4 and 2 Peter 3.9, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And in 2 Peter 3.9, God says, the Word of God says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a change of mental attitude. And therefore, the free will of man is the issue. God did not compromise the integrity of his character. He provided salvation for all. The first three parts of the barrier provided for all. The first three parts of the barrier are applied to all members of the human race. Salvation is a gift from God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For we have been saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But like any gift, and every gift in life, the giver pays the price, and the recipient is free to accept or reject the gift. You know, when gifts are given, usually people accept the gift because they like getting things. So, God is just tapping His foot, waiting for your move, the most important move you can make while you are still alive, by appropriating to His message of salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Let us pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us dedicate the closing moments to those without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life. Now this is the most important moment in your life, in your entire life. As you sit there and you consider who Jesus Christ is and what he has done, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. That means the Lord Jesus Christ is either a liar or he is what he says he is, the Savior. He is the Savior. What does that mean? That means Jesus Christ came into this earth, took on the form of man, and was God, undiminished deity, and true humanity in one person. He came for one reason, and that was to die, to die for you. Greater love has no man than to give up his life for a friend. The Lord Jesus says, Christ did not give up his life for a friend. He gave it up for the entire world. 
even for those who hated him, even for the Pharisees who hated him. He died for them, and he died for you. What does that matter, you might ask? It matters because while he hung on the cross, God the Father imputed to him the perfect God-man, the one who did not sin. He was made sin for us, that through him we might become the righteousness of God. Now salvation is open. Open to anybody. All that man has to do is to use his God-given free will and for him to make a decision to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And his salvation is instantly settled once and for all. Therefore, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We thank you, Father, for that so great salvation. We thank you for sending to us your Son as our substitute in paying for our sins. And now, as your children, we pray that you guide us in our Christian life, that we may be able to attain our spiritual goal, which is spiritual maturity, the capacity stage, thus glorifying you, who deserves all the honor, all the respect, all the love, all the adoration, all the worship, all the praises. All these we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>